In this episode, we are going to be reviewing The Night Porter from 1974. This was directed by Liliana Cavani, and it starred Dirk Bogard and Charlotte Rampling. This is the second time I will be reviewing The Night Porter on my YouTube podcast, but this time I will be joined by writer Sam Deegan, where we will also be discussing her fantastic book, The Legacy of World War II in European Art House Cinema. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where I explore movies with a guest and from all over the world, and we discuss how those movies were told on film. I want to welcome to the show Sam Deegan, who is a Philadelphia-based writer, editor, and film historian covering everything from classic film to Euro cult. She is the author of a monograph on Fritz Lang's M., and she has contributed liner essays and commentary tracks to over 100 Blu-ray releases. She is also the co-host of Daughters of Darkness, Twitch of the Death Nerve, and Evil Eye Podcasts. And her most recent book, which we're discussing today, is The Legacy of World War II in European Art House Cinema, which I just finished yesterday and absolutely loved. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. So before we jump into the book, I, I just wanted to explore your, your background a bit. Uh, how did you initially just get into to movies in general? Where did you, when and where did your love begin? It really, I think, has been kind of a lifelong thing. I mean, I grew up in a family full of people who loved watching a lot of movies. I mean, Everything from the sort of, you know, like, let's watch Young Frankenstein and quote it to each other a million times type of thing to once channels like Turner Classic Movies came around, you know, my grandparents who raised me would introduce me to movies they loved when they were young. And so I think that's sort of where it stemmed from. And, and what about, you know, uh, because this, this book was what's so fascinating is not only explores the you know European art house films, but also is part part of you know you have to obviously the I, I imagine you want the audience to understand the context of of uh, the war at the same time and you know how the films really relate to uh, you know that the war does not fall into a black and white area that which often it is perceived that it falls more more in yeah. the in, in the shades of gray so. When did you just first get interested in, in that war in general? Well, so I think that's another thing that connects back to my grandparents who I dedicated the book to because, you know, my, my grandmother grew up in a German family and had a tough time as a kid during the war, like being bullied for being German. And so it was just something that we talked about a lot while I was growing up. And I took this, so the high school that I went to offered kind of history elective classes. And I was a German major and took this elective called Holocaust and Genocide and that my German teacher taught. And that I think is where I got just such a different, better understanding of the complexities. And I think my interest in writing this book or sort of what led me down the path to write the book is that history so often in an educational context or in a media context is presented like propaganda basically. And there is usually so much more to the story than what we're being told or what angle someone's decided to capitalize on. And I just got really interested in the ways in which different filmmakers kind of responded to World War II, which, you know, I think because of its global impact, film studios always sort of sought to present it a specific way. And so in the years after the war ended, I think filmmakers, a lot of them obviously, wanted to reflect on the war in a different way. And like, Something that I sort of touch on in the book is, you know, you could probably write thousands of books on World War II and still not cover every story in depth because so many different countries and different communities had such wildly different experiences. 
Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And do you, you know, actually, before we get into the night part, I just wanted to mention because you you talk about so many films, some of which I had seen, some of which I have heard of but haven't seen, but some that I hadn't heard of that I, I I caught up on some of them. I have what many more to go through, but the Cremator is one that I I just oh, love. It's uh, so good. It's so good. The Silence of the Sea, which and I know Melville's films, particularly you know you think of him more as a crime filmmaker. Uh, and, you know, someone who was really influenced by, ho- uh, you know, Hollywood crime films. Uh, and then you look at his early films and you're like, like this. I was like, wow, this is Melville. Um, I love that. Uh, Capo, I had heard of and also just saw, which I love. Ivan's Childhood, I knew of, but hadn't seen before. Another great one. And Young Torless, I was really blown away by. I was just blown away. Just the, the, the different new waves from every single country and for anyone, you know, if you're interested in the book, Sam really focuses on countries that were occupied by the Nazis. So, you know, France and Italy and Czechoslovakia. Uh, so, uh, you know, she, of course, is Russian new wave. Um, I, I really I can't say enough about it. I just think it's I just think it's really, really great. So if you're a history buff or a film buff, uh, this is something you'll you'll really want to read. Tell me, uh, you know, I know you speak highly of the Night Porter, which I I've always really really loved. Um, how did you, when did you first see it, and how did you feel about it then? And has your feelings about it evolved with which each viewing has it changed over time? Um, I would say that probably the first time I saw the Night Porter, I was maybe seventeen or eighteen. It was not too long after I saw Solo for the first time, and I just fell in love with it. I think something that is definitely a little frustrating for a lot of people who get into European art house cinema is that it seems to be, you know, dominated mostly by men. Right. And it was just surprising to me as a teenager to discover that there were women making films sort of not in this in the same way but in a similar vein to directors like Pasolini yeah and I think Liliana Cavani uh Lena Vertmuller is another Mm, one mm. were just really not afraid to explore these taboo topics politics and definitely to look at things from this angle that I think makes the film still feel kind of controversial I think it definitely oh, for yeah. Cavani and Vertmuller but I mean yeah. The Night Porter it's one of those movies that I think could only have been made in the 70s right. in the sense that it takes these kind of post-war themes and combines them with this sadomasochistic sexual relationship and you know there's just this kind of like air of decay that you see in so many so many of the films from that time you know when I first saw it I didn't I had the I saw it just over 10 years ago and I hadn't heard of it and I I used to live in England so uh, a guy I was taking acting class classes with had an extra ticket to, to go see it at the BFI and I just thought it was an intriguing title I'm like the night there's something about the night porter I just thought okay it sounds <laughs> like a thriller <laughs> Yes, and, and I know it is it is kind of part thriller in, in yeah. a sense. Um, and so we so I went and I was just blown away by it. And I think I was fortunate to have seen it in a theater. Uh, and every time I see it, I, I love it more and more. And I, I and I, I don't know if you have, but I have gotten into some arguments about this film, because as you said, people have found it. Uh, con- you know that it that, you know even review reviewers at the time as I'm sure you know Ebert Roger Ebert you know it's, it was you know he was like <laughs> my oh, nemesis <laughs> yeah <laughs> I you know he, he I, there are some great reviews I've written and, and sometimes I just feel he's way off and this is one of them because um, you know he's him and other you know major critics then were felt that it was sort of uh, exploitive and offensive and disgusting and crap and cheat and and it's just like they just tore it up and I just think I don't think you really really you know watched this movie and gave it any real no. thought and I had a bit of an argument with actually he's a very well, well-known writer in Canada I won't say who it is but 
he was he was saying similar things like how can you how can you portray a sadomasochistic relationship within the confines of, of a holocaust like that's disgusting and i I, 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 I must admit, I occasionally did get pulled into that thinking, oh, mm, maybe there's there's something that's true about that. And then I, I kind of go back and forth. And then every time I watch it, I'm like, no, actually, if you read particularly your book or really know more about the war and know what, you know, what Lee Cavani was getting at with this film, I don't I, I actually don't find it's as controversial as people really think. So I, I'm curious you know, for people who may debate you on it and say that it's, you know, uh, offensive. I mean, what, what, what would you say to that? What would your, I'm curious what your response would be. Well, this is a little bit of a struggle for me because I don't, I guess because that perspective is so far from my own. Like, I guess what I mean by that is I don't, I don't always think that viewpoint of, you know, is this offensive? Okay, if it is, let's just not watch it or ever talk about it. Like, I don't think that's a very constructive way of engaging with or talking about art. And, you know, as somebody who watches and writes about and talks about a lot of exploitation films, it it's a pretty foreign way of thinking to me. So I guess if you're somebody who is mostly familiar with mainstream cinema, yeah, I'm sure this is going to be shocking and uncomfortable and right. raises all these questions. Like a couple months ago, I was on a projection booth episode about Swept Away. Yes, uh, I listened to that one. And the guest, ho- the other guest host on the episode had never seen the film before and was coming more from the perspective that you're talking about, where he basically just said, you know, I couldn't get into this film. And it, it's not the same as Night Porter for anyone who hasn't seen Swept Away, but it has a similar relationship dynamic going on yes, where does, there's yeah. just a very complicated relationship. But I think these sorts of films especially made by you know these left-wing italian filmmakers in the 70s and certainly other countries in in that area as well they look at these complicated issues i think in the gray scale that they deserve you know relationships are complicated and this is a film it's not a documentary it's not saying you know this is how your relationship should be right it's so I I tend to take these films as fantasy and allegory and it, it also I think raises the issue that not only is sexuality incredibly complicated but so is trauma and trauma recovery right and I think that also kind of connects back to why I wanted to focus on films that were made in countries that had been really impacted by the war because all the films I talk about are made primarily by filmmakers who lived through the war and so we're grappling with that idea of personal trauma and communal trauma and I think that is what Cavani really gets into in the Night Porter is like how does the legacy of this impact who we are as people and like is it something we can ever move beyond yes exactly exactly and as you you go you know beautifully into in detail in your book is that people which you you see in this film a, a little bit is that a lot of people did whatever they had to do in the war to survive so yeah. As you said, people compromised. They were complicit with the Nazis. Like I, I, I didn't really know much about the Vichy government. The, I, I had no idea. Oh, yeah. You know, because it's true. I always thought of France as the 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 resistant fighters, like the Casablanca. I love Casablanca. Oh, me too. <laughs> but the the Casablanca version of. Um, and of that's how, how that's things. how France has always thought of France. <laughs> yes, exactly. But- the the reality is so much more complicated and that's why i think films like the night porter and a lot of the movies i talk about in the book 
feel politically relevant today is because they get at these issues of just how difficult survival can be Mm, mm. and how you sort of have to put morals aside and prioritize other things sometimes. Yes. Yes, which makes for, you know, very interesting, complicated stories that a lot of these yeah. filmmakers were putting up on the screen. And, and as you said earlier, and I think that's true, when people uh, may perhaps watch this or they watch Seven Beauties, which is also, Lerna, yeah. which is a film I love, uh, Word Up by Werner Wertmuller, um, they, you know, and, I, and I'm shocked by, by them to this day. And I- Oh and yeah, I, <laughs> they're shocking. <laughs> so I can imagine someone who's only really- you know, really only know Schindler's List or, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and I like the pianist and, and Polanski was in the P and, and actually we do see a, a sympathetic German soldier towards the end. Uh, but, but they are yeah. rather cut and dry, m- more so Schindler's List for sure. You know, Nazis are pure evil and everyone else are the, 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 the heroes and the, the good people fighting back. Um, and I and I and on, honestly, before I read this, and even though I had seen some of these films, that is often how I how I viewed the war myself. And I just listening to you on the projection booth when you I, I think it was on the Seven Beauties episode you you also did when I when you were saying, well, yeah. it actually falls more in the shades of gray. I was like, what? <laughs> but then you're it right. Does. You're, so I read your book and did more research, and I was like. You know, and it and it makes sense. I mean, when it's a, a gun to your head versus, uh, you know, as we saw in Capo, for example, you know, she she starts to sleep with uh, some of the Nazi officers, and she even be, she becomes a Capo, and she was ri- originally a, a a Jewish woman brought into the the camp, and they you know said, no, you're no longer Jewish, pretend you're someone else. So the nature of identity, of course, of course, comes into question. And I thought, wow. Uh, you know, it's just something we just don't look at it that way. And I, I don't no. know, I'm not really sure why. I mean, maybe perhaps people just like to think of things sim- simplest in a very simple way. They're comfortable that way. I don't know how you feel about it's, that. Well, it's easier and it's more comfortable. And that's also like the people who complain about these sorts of films and say that, you know, this is unpleasant subject matter and exploitative and why should it you know why should it be in art in a weird way and hopefully I can explain this connection in a weird way they kind of remind me of those people who say you know I never vote because it doesn't impact me Mm, it's mm. like it's nice that you've had a life so untouched (laughs) by trauma that you want these stories to just all be nice and straightforward but like that's not how life is for the majority of people right and so I think it's important that artists can explore those kinds of complexities especially when it comes to things like war and sort of mass trauma and a lot of the movies to come out in the 60s and 70s do start to look at who is actually responsible and if someone has become a Nazi soldier or a collaborator, why? Like, and and I think a lot of the films raise the point that it's not necessarily because these people are inherently evil. They're just trying to survive. Maybe maybe they don't know any better. It's very empathetic. I mean, it's not like, oh, how dare you compromise? It's, uh, I mean, like I said, when someone has a gun to you or is gonna torture you or throw you into an oven, how do you know what you would do, right? Like, I mean, you really can't judge uh, this time, which was, you know, some of the worst atrocities in in the history of of the world. So I'm really glad that that you wrote this just in terms of, of history in general. But looking at, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, uh, I just wanted to, to discuss the nature of this relationship because Yes, it is sadomasochistic, but I, I think it's even mo- it goes into more complex areas than that. I, I was curious how you view the nature of their relationship or how, what you took from it. 
I mean, I do think there is a degree of Cavani wanting this to be a sexual fantasy and to be a transgressive film. I mean, when you think about the fact that Last Tango in Paris came out in 71 and, you know, I think the same year is Pasolini's Decameron. And so the rest of the 70s, Italian producers and directors, I think, felt, if not comfortable, then maybe even pressured by the success of those films and the notoriety of those films to include more sexually transgressive material in their own movies. So I, I'm not trying to suggest that Cavani made this because she, you know, wanted to sort of profit off of Last Tango in Paris or something, but it gave certain filmmakers who wanted to make more explicit transgressive movies the freedom to do that. Right. And so right. it's so much more than just a story of, you know, two people who encounter each other after the war. It like it is that, but it also like just the way they kind of absorb into each other and lose their identities. I think really gets into the nature of trauma and traumatic memory and how it can sort of change your sense of self and who like what your fundamental personality seems to be. And yeah. it happens to both of them, which I think is yes. important to note. It's not like he's the dominant one and remains just sort of in control and unaffected. His life unravels as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very well said. No, I agree, because it's, you, you, you know, for, I mean, again, as you're right, it's, a, it's a what if, it's not a what is, you know, so if a, yeah. if a German SS officer had fallen in love with someone in a concentration camp, what, what would that be like? And, and, you know, if, if, if it turned into something sadomasochistic, well, then, I can I can believe that because it's born out of pain. It's born out of death and uh, torture. And uh, you know, at the same time, you know, he you at first you initially see him, you know, tormenting her like it, the, those flashbacks. He's like shooting shooting at her in a washroom, um, and she's trying to get out of the way of the bullets, and he's playing with her, and then suddenly you know, he's, he's uh, uh, cuddling her and giving her better clothes. And, um, you know, but then, uh, you, you know, then of course the, the more sexual scenes, you know, he's putting his fingers in her mouth. And uh, so you can understand that as, that it, it, it would go in that area because of their environment. And also she's a young, she was like a teenager. So these are probably her, likely her first you know, sexual encounters. So she's learning about sex this way. And then this man where she's so afraid is the only one probably giving, even though he's tormenting her, he's also saving her and giving her some kind of affection and love. And so she has these complicated feelings of him where she's both afraid, but yet in love with him. And even perhaps somewhat of a father figure, like you see later on, in the film when he says she's my, he, he keeps referring to her as his little girl. Uh, so it's, it's yeah. that other woman that he was talking to, who I believe lived in that hotel he worked at uh, in Vienna. And, and so it's, it's, it's so, it's so complicated in, in, in that regard. And, you know, I, I actually really, you know, the more you look at it, I, I don't see that as being anything that's so far out or so like, since you know oh let's let's shock people with this it's it's like okay well let's sit down like you know i think what it, it would have been more offensive if it was just some clear-cut romance <laughs> you know because yes. that would just be like that would just feel so tacked on you know i mean i i do think that cavani is intentionally being over the top with their relationship because they're like if you want to look at it in the lens of you know historical possibility there are a lot of certainly issues with their relationship I mean oh for sure you know you could spend a lot of time thinking and talking about what 
that could have looked like in an actual concentration camp where certainly women were forced to become sex workers, were raped, were forced to exchange sex for food in order to survive right. food and blankets and things like that, which, as you mentioned, is a much bigger theme of something like Ponte Corvo's Capo. Yes. But the big thing to remember is that much like, you know, the modern prison system, concentration camps were set up to intentionally dehumanize people. So movies that have actual like straightforward romantic relationships occurring there it just feels so gross yeah and i I think this movie acknowledges that this is a fantasy and it's not supposed to represent any kind of ethical relationship i mean obviously for all the reasons that you brought up looking at their past relationship in the camp there's no way she could have fairly consented to any of that based on her age you know she's a prisoner and many many other reasons but i think the movie doesn't ask you to treat any of this like it's factual it's just I, i think this allegory for all of these different kinds of complicated feelings we have about trauma and sex and relationships. And I also think where people might have a legitimate point of frustration is that like, I don't think this is a fair or accurate portrayal of a real sadomasochistic relationship. This is much more destructive and abusive. Whereas sadomasochistic relationships are based on a series of agreed upon well-communicated fantasies that are being played out between people who respect and care for each other and here it's a totally different thing it's just these people are so consumed by the past that when they see each other again it's like it unlocks something and their present lives just fade away Mm -hmm. which I think it's interesting that so many filmmakers touch upon themes like that in these sorts of post-World War II movies because there were a number of Holocaust survivors and war survivors who were artists or kind of celebrated public figures who wound up killing themselves. And so it's, I do think there is this idea that like there are some traumas that people just can't move beyond. Yeah. I think, I think for me that that's really the biggest takeaway. I mean, I think, you know, you you can't really boil this down to, to a certain essence because it's so complicated, but I think the biggest takeaway is the fact that they both sort of died in those camps already. Like spiritually speaking, they 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 already died because as you said, people, you know, with, with trauma, you sort of stand still. You can't, it's, I don't wanna say everybody can't, but it's very, very difficult to, to work through something like what these people experience. And so when you see, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, uh, you know, they they meet again 12 years after the war in Vienna and Ma- Dirk Bogard, who plays Max, is working as a night porter in a hotel. And um, Lucia, played by Charlotte Rampling, is there with her husband and he's a famous conductor. So they're staying at the hotel and now they this is where they see each other. And the thriller aspect of the film is the fact that Max is facing these trials uh, where he's he could... fake, totally insane show trials. That's one of my favorite yeah. elements of the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the the other S former SS officers that he's still in touch with, they're trying to rid the past and burn any documents that they did anything wrong, and so they have these photos, and they ask Mass, "Hey, do you recognize anyone here?" And of course, Lucia Charlotte Rampling is in the picture, and now she's there. So. Of course, the dilemma is he doesn't want her to be killed by them because naturally they'd kill her if they found her. And so they've chained themselves up in this in the hotel uh, and, and they basically like in the camps, they imprison themselves again. And he, you know, ties her up and uh, so they can't take her out. 
And I love the detail when one of the guys does get in there and then he says, well, chains can be cut, but you know, it's almost as if, you know, Max didn't even think about that because it's sort of more symbolic of the fact that they're reliving yeah. uh, everything that has happened to them. And, and, and they're, they're because they, they really couldn't get past it. Uh, so I think, I don't know, for me that, I think it's more about that as opposed to some romance or sadomasochistic romance. I don't know how you, what you think. Yeah, they're sort of locked together in trauma, I think is the best way I can describe it. And it would be a very different film if he kidnapped her and held her against her will, but the chains yeah. really are symbolic because if he took them off, she wouldn't leave. Yes, yes, because as you know, she could just go to the police, but because she's also connected and tied to him deeply, she doesn't want him to be, you know, uh, killed or put in prison. And, you know, because otherwise she would have to, the police would obviously, you know, at least try to get her to testify uh, against him in these trials. So uh, it's brilliant. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so, it's so dark, uh, but there's, you know, what I like about the film is that they tell so much of the story visually. Uh, you know, if you look at the conversations between Lucia and Max, there's, there's, there's hardly much even dialogue between them. It's really the ways in which they're uh, looking at each other. Uh, of course, the-, the It's the, so visceral. It, it, it's so visceral and it's a testament to the brilliant performances by Charlotte Rampling and Dirk Bogard. Uh, you know, when they first see each other again, at first, you know, he thinks that perhaps she's there to testify against him and he's, you know, smacking her and, and he's, you know, are, what, why are you here? And then they start to laugh and then they start to kiss and then they, you know, at first she's afraid of him. So they must have, I really would love to know how they worked creatively on this because as an actor myself, to, to have, to go to those kind of places with another actor, there has to be a lot of trust. Um, yeah, so the, I, I mean, those are, like, I think they're two of the greatest performers of their yeah. time. I mean, still Charlotte Rampling is. She's so but, good. She's so underrated in my, in my yes. opinion. I mean, he definitely talked about in some interviews how, so he served in the war and yes. was in a unit that liberated one of the concentration camps. I want to say maybe Bergen Belsen, but- uh, I know it started with a B. Yeah, I think you're right. I read that uh, as well. And, yeah, and he talks about how, just how that experience was something that changed his life forever. And so I think in his various amazing roles from the 60s and 70s, I mean, everything from The Servant oh, to yeah. this film, but yeah. he just is a master. The He's so- yeah and he's so good at displaying like you were saying without any dialogue this sense of just like deep like pushed down emotional pain yeah and so he when he does play those sorts of roles like in the damned i think he brings so much nuance to it that you don't see in anything like a movie like schindler's list which of course is why I wanted to put that still. So the cover of my book is him in the night porter shooting a movie of her in the concentration camp. It's sort of like shown right. as a flashback to the past because right. I think he he's in so many of these films. Yeah, no, he's he is he is so 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 good. I, I uh, and as you said, complete. I mean, I think I had only first heard of him maybe six years ago, uh, seven years. No, no, well, of course I saw He's the night So that, I guess that would have been the first time I heard of him just over 10 years ago. And um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, he can do so much just with his expressions. And this film is old in the behavior and same with Charlotte Rampling. I mean, I know she has this like, uh, you know, ethereal beauty 
Uh, I mean, those eyes are like, she looks like a tiger. I mean, but at the same time, uh, she just could convey so much with them. I mean, when they first see each other in the hotel and that, uh, you know, the audience at first doesn't, doesn't know, doesn't know that they knew each other already. I mean, obviously by the way they look at each other, they know each other, but you don't know how yet. And just the stunned look on her face and then, of course, gradually the flashback, the flashbacks show her in the camps and he's filming her. And what I love is that you, as the audience, you think, oh, OK, she's seeing an SS officer from the past. And then with each flashback, you see a bit more. And she's also terrified of him at first. She doesn't want to see yeah. him. She doesn't even want him to come into the room. But then all of a sudden, what's interesting is that when her husband had to leave, she wants to stay and naturally it's because she wanted to go see him and she even goes and something i didn't catch before was that she goes and gets uh the a, a similar uh nightgown that she wore in the camps so that she could wear it with him and i love the scene which is a really fascinating scene when they're together and she shows him the, the she shows him that nightgown and then she looks in his closet and sees his his SS officer uniform. And what's what I love about the, what's so interesting there is like, you know, it, it's almost like a couple who have been together and they're thinking about their first date. And these people are thinking like about their early romance. And but yet it's so it's so twisted. It's like born out of a, a concentration camp. So on the one hand, I'm feeling sort of like the the beauty of just the fact that they love each other but then i'm sort of like like it's it's so it's so uh dark uh how they they met and unfortunate i don't know if those moments popped out to you i'm sure they did but i was curious i think to me the so those moments and there's a lot about their relationship that feels a little bit satirical to me. Like Cavani is sort of maybe eviscerating a little bit this fetishization of traumatic memory that, you know, happens in different cycles throughout our culture. And that definitely happened around this period with World War II. So the trial of Adolf Eichmann in the early 60s, it was really the first time that people spoke in a public way about what happened in the Holocaust. And that's when the details were most widely known. But by the early to mid 70s, you have a series of trials throughout Europe based on different concentration camps and different death camps trying to prosecute people who perpetrated the absolute horrors that took place there. But when you read about the history of those trials, it's like basically just this media frenzy where there are these survivors giving this like unimaginably horrifying testimony but it feels, it almost feels like a show trial, sort of like in the Night Porter, where it's like, okay, we're going to bring this into media attention, and then we're not really actually going to do anything. Because in most of those cases, the people who are put on trial are like, you know, most of the camp commandants by that point were dead, or, you know, had disappeared which I think she also sort of connects back to the like Nazi sleeper cell that's waiting around and trying to find something to do. But there, I think for a lot of people in the seventies, like Cavani, definitely like Pasolini, there's this sense of like, why are we still living in this trauma, but we're not actually confronting it. And it just feels hypocritical. And mm -hmm. West, West Germany was particularly guilty of that where it's like we're gonna have these trials to make people feel better but no one's actually going to be punished and we're not actually going to address the fact that we just absorbed the majority of these people back into our society right. and they were never really punished right yeah and I, so i think there's a lot about that going on 
in a deeper way in the way that their relationship plays out and how they just like repeat these things and put on these old costumes. Yes, yes. And then of course you see at the end, you know, when he basically gives up and puts his uniform on and, and she puts on that same dress, like exactly, you know, not only that, like he even dresses her up, like she looked like she was 15 again. And, and they go out and they're, and they're, they're shot down. Uh, which of course was symbolic of the fact that I think that really they they were already because they couldn't confront what happened and I don't blame them that they couldn't um, they were already they were already dead in in a lot of ways so it's it's really it's really really powerful emotion it's one of those films that every time I see it when it ends I'm sort of like you get so invested emotionally in it that you forget where yes. you are and then you just have to like breathe for like a five minutes <laughs> like it does it I've seen it maybe I don't know five times I mean not like a ton of times but I've you know a decent amount and I always have that a very similar reaction very visceral reaction um, me too and I've seen it a lot of times I and I think there are similar narratives to this in other films that are like actual like low budget Nazi exploitation films that don't have that that just feel really offensive and don't right. have any of the emotional impact and I think it's just the strength of the directing and these two performers that make it feel so much more than that because to the question that you raised or sort of connected to the question that you raised earlier like how do I respond when people are offended by this movie there are definitely a number of film critics who over the years, I think, have questioned whether this should be thought of as an art house movie or an exploitation movie. And I think that's part of its genius is it it's not telling you how you can classify it. It's forcing you to think about it. Yes, yeah, that's exactly it. It's not it's not giving you all the answers. I mean, you have to really which are the kind of films I like that they're so detailed and so complicated, particularly psychologically, that you, 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 you both, it's not that you're just thinking your way through it, but you're both really feeling it, even if it's making you mad or, or, yes, but, or but uncomfortable. Then, or, 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 yeah, exactly, or uncomfortable. But then you really have to give a lot of, of thought to the, the whys behind all we see. And as we said, so much of this film is told visually it's not like someone's coming and saying let me explain this to you <laughs> you know it's uh you you have to really fill in the blanks and i love the i mean the cinematography of this is so beautiful uh in you know the vienna and the the flashbacks this was by alfio pontoni he also did il sorpasso and the priest wife two films i love plus plus many others w would you say this was sort of like expressionistic and the it was very gray and black and blue it's, there's hardly any really any colors in it yeah which i think is meant to intentionally evoke some of those 30s and 40s films it because it i guess some of my favorite film some, some of my favorite art house films of the 70s from italy I think I associate with being very colorful and this is very intentionally a muted color palette. Yes, yeah, yeah. When you say 30s and 40s, you mean like European 30s and 40s? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the sort of expressionistic stuff that I think it's trying to reference or intentionally is referencing because they are basically trapped in that past. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, and that, uh, the, the music in this film by uh, Danielle, Daniele Paris. I love that song. I mean, you could just listen to that all day, that song off the top that you hear throughout the film. Was, I don't know if you, do you was that written for the film? I don't know if you would happen to know that. I think it was. I also, I, I know that uh, Carl Berm, who is Carl Heinz Berm's father uh, from Peeping Tom, also did some composing for this oh but I, I but i think that music already existed and was just used yeah yeah because just looking on imdb there's there's a bunch of different so, uh, songs written in it but this one it, the title of the song is the same as the film so i imagine it's it was for 
Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure some of it is original. And then there's, of course, a lot of 40s music that's yeah. used in it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, one thing I noticed this time when I saw it again was, you know, when you see Matt, like it, because, because you're, you're, it's told with the utmost empathy, but really Max through even, even in Vienna is not a nice guy. I mean, with his coworkers, no. he's very bossy. Um, and he's, he's, he's almost abusive towards them. That one guy he works with, he's like telling him to get out. And did you do this? And he's like, he's one guy's like off the top. You see is like a prostitute uh in 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 the hotel that he's basically pimping this guy out because I, every time i think of this i think about the fact that he you know you see him uh at when he's alone he turns off all the lights you know and then he's and he even says to the other ss officers i don't i don't like to be in the light so naturally it's because he's try he just cannot you know he can't face himself so he'd rather just shut everything off and i think that's another reason it was symbolic of the fact that he was working at night. Uh, so you see that a few times how he was constantly shutting the lights off. And when his coworker turned them on, he just, you know, he, he flipped out, but I, I never, you know, of course, and with Lucia, every time he needs something from her, like information, for example, his first instinct is to smack, to hit. Uh, so again, I think he almost hates himself, but it's, it's because he can't confront himself and you're not really, to sure, like obviously the other SS officers are still, you know, hold on to those not that Nazi, you know, ideology. Whereas with him, you're not so sure because, you know, at one point he does the Nazi salute towards them when they were like, I would never, I don't regret anything I've ever done when they're talking on top of the roof. And then he does yeah. the Nazi salute first and then they do it. And then he just kind of shrugs. Like it was almost as if to say, guys, I was kidding. <laughs> he seems... You know, he seems I don't know what you very, thought. very tired by life. Like, right. In contrast, I think those the former Nazis, they remind me of those sorts of guys who kind of sit around and talk about their glory days in yeah, college. Days, but like, yeah. yeah. But like, instead of their glory days being in a frat house, they're working as Nazi guards in a concentration camp. And right. you do get the sense that their show trials and their constant discussions about, you know, some action that could be happening in the future is all just fantasy until Lucia arrives and there is this tangible, real reminder of the past. Because at the time in the 70s, you also have to remember that there were people like the Wiesenthals who were going around actively hunting Nazis and, you know, Mossad and Israel was working with them. That was sort of one of their big projects at the time. So I do think there is this real life element that they maybe were afraid of being captured and arrested and brought to trial but it's also almost like they get off on that fear because or that anxiety because there's nothing else in their lives. And I think Max is the only one who is aware that there's nothing else. Like that's he it. just seems so empty. Yeah. That, you know, that's interesting because it, it actually never occurred to me that those trials they weren't worried about are not actually happening. Cause I actually thought that they were happening. So you, you thought that there, that's, that wasn't a real threat. Like that was not something that was actually going to happen. I think it's something that they are blowing way out of proportion. It's it's like because this whole identity and this time in history, it's like that was the time that they felt really power. The only time probably that they felt powerful and important. I see. I see. So I think they fix they fixated on it so much that it get definitely gets blown out of proportion. At least that's my reading of it. Like, yes, certainly former Nazis who were higher profile guards were in danger of being arrested and, and, you know, taken to trial, but it didn't really happen to that many people, which is why to me, it seems like I was saying earlier, like it was a symbolic gesture, but also 
that's why I don't think they really had anything to worry about because like, yes, there were Nazi hunters around and yes, there were these trials, but to me, it just seemed like a bunch of self-important windbags wanting to feel important still. That's interesting because actually in height, now that I think back, I remember when they asked Max, Hey, are you worried about this? He's like, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. And I was wondering, I'm like, why is he not as worried as these guys? But now that you make sense, it's because there, it wasn't like, Hey, you've got to be in court Thursday and all this kind of stuff. Um, they, yeah. they were just preparing for something that may or may not happen, you know? So yeah, that's interesting. And, 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 and really, you know, you, these guys are, have no guilt about anything. Like they seem to just be fine. And they've, as you said, they've integrated into uh, society, whereas Max is much more tormented by, and, and, you know, again, Max is a guy who executed people. I mean, you, you hear that and you see in his behavior that he is, He's uh, cruel, even not just with, as I said, not just with Charlotte Rampling as Lucia, but with the, with the other with the other people. Which you know, when I when I read your book, it's you know I, I as we as you explore all the different countries or were complicit or compromised out of necessity. When you see um, more of a sympathetic. Um, Nazi. I was curious in in your research. Did you did you find some like were, were there Nazis you like? Was there a number of them who came out th to regret their actions? Well, I think this is a complicated question because what winds up happening is this, and, and you can see this throughout a lot of West. German specifically, East, some East German as well, but definitely West German art and cinema and literature and even media in the 50s and 60s is this idea that there's this just like deep sense of shame that no one should talk about. Right. And so right. there wasn't really a platform for people to come forward and say, I really regret my actions. Like that's something that maybe happened 50 years later. I mean, you see similar things going on in Japan with this like constant refusal by the Japanese government to accept or to accept any responsibility for the atrocities in China. But it's like every once in a while you get individual people who were there who just before they die say like, yes, I was there. I did this. I'm sorry. If you read, there's actually this really interesting accessible book called In the Garden of Beasts, uh, which is written by the guy who did The Devil in the White City that uh sort of nonfiction book that looks at serial killer H.H. H. Holmes, who was operating in Chicago during the World's Fair, and it kind of juxtaposes those two things. In the Garden of Beasts is about the American ambassador to Nazi Germany who lived in Berlin with his family during part of the war. And in that book, he talks a lot about sympathetic Nazis and people who changed their mind. I mean, you know, there are people who tried to, like Nazi officers who tried to assassinate Hitler for a variety of reasons. Right. But I think when you are put into this situation where there's nothing else for you to do other than, you know, join the war effort or go into a concentration camp, it changes the way people think about things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of mass pressure after the war not to, like, there just really was no cultural environment for people to express regret. Right, right. And yeah. you, you have people like, in high level political positions who were former Nazis, who do everything they can in the 50s and 60s, like under Adenauer in West Germany, 
to repress any mention of the fact that they served in the war. So I think it's just this, like, put your blinders on and forget that any of this ever happened. Like, that's right. what's encouraged. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it really makes me wonder when I read your book and, of course, see something like The Silence of the Sea, which, you know, the Nazi officer there is this guy um, who, like, loves France, loves, like... <laughs> he loves art and culture, and yeah. he's... Howard Vernon is the greatest. So great, uh, so great. And it's, what's fascinating to me is that so many Central European actors, and Howard Vernon is Swiss, um, so many Central European actors who left Europe because of the war or, you know, whatever they were doing throughout the 40s and 50s, so many of them were forced to play Nazis and they hated it. Like Conrad Veidt, the great German actor, has an amazing role as Major Strasser in Casablanca, yeah. but yeah. talked in interviews about how much he fucking hated playing Nazis right. and how it made him not want to act because with his accent, it seemed like those were the only roles he could get. So I love that Howard Vernon, who has had such an incredible career working with like everyone under the sun, uh, was willing so soon after the war, really, to play a sympathetic Nazi. Like it right. just is bold because he's so likable. He is. He, 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 he totally is. And, and it just, it, it, you know, again, this was made by Melville, who was part of the French resistance. Right. So it's like, it's, yeah. It, and is, and was Jewish and, and was Jewish, which is really fascinating to me. And you know, another thing that I'm not sure if I saw it before, but one line that I don't recall hearing in the Night Porter was when he's meeting with Mario, the guy he who they think will possibly be able to uh, recognize Lucia in the photo, and so Dirk Bogard plans to kill him on a fishing trip. Um, he mentions that she was a socialist daughter. So I forgot that actually her character is not Jewish. And I know that yes. Cavani said she did that intentionally. So people perhaps wouldn't be as outraged or there's, this wouldn't be this long conversation about uh, the torturer and the, the person in a concentration camp who's Jewish. Because of course, as we all know, Jewish people were targeted the most and got the worst treatment. But as Cavani said, there were all kinds of camps. And as you said in, in the, the book as well, I mean, there were socialists in there, there were resistance fighters, there was all kinds of people. And so she was just happened to be the daughter of a, of a socialist. So I imagine well, she did that for a, maybe a little less outrage. I don't know what you think. I, th I think so. I feel like though that's one of the most complicated elements of the film because the overall issue with a lot of World War II movies, especially movies made during the war years, but this also, I think, applies to movies made afterwards, is the degree of anti-Semitism that I think might not be intentional, but is just sort of inherent and kind of like latent. And what I mean by that is there's this erasure of Jewish experience. When you think about a film like Schindler's List, there are really no major Jewish characters. They're all these like two-dimensional stereotypes yeah. who kind of exist on the fringes of the film. And the biggest characters are non-Jewish Germans like Oscar Schindler and some of the Nazis. And you see it so often in movies where they talk about how the Nazis are evil and, you know, everybody can agree on that point, but right, they're much course. hazier about who the victims of the Holocaust are. And some movies will actually come out and say, especially a little bit later, like Capo, you know, it leaves no ambiguity. It's like, she is a Jewish girl. Right. But it's, it's like filmmakers in general are reluctant to say how big of a target the Jews were, which is something that I, like, I get what Cavani is trying to do and not have it be as transgressive as if it's, you know, a Nazi officer and a Jewish woman, but it's still like, 
why why in general do filmmakers seem so hesitant to just say like yes the jews were the primary victims of the holocaust like right. there's also a chance that it could be a reflection of policy of nazi policy so like an attempt to sort of be historically accurate and by that what i mean is generally in concentration camps officers sort of did whatever they wanted meaning they were allowed to have sexual relationships with prisoners whether that meant rape or something that might be described as cons- I like I don't think you can have a real consensual relationship in that particular environment but it pretty much said as long as you don't have any relations with Jewish women which of course one of the really big taboo subjects even for historians and even for holocaust memoirs is sexual violence in the holocaust like i think there's this big reluctance on the part of survivors to talk about it which is understandable and so it hasn't really been featured in the history of the holocaust as much as it should because certainly jewish women were raped but I think the more standardized versions of history talk about how, you know, like the the joy divisions, the the Nazi brothels, the women who were forced to be sex workers there were not Jewish women. And and so I think it's the official policy was like, well, it's okay if you want to, you know, rape someone, but try and make sure it's not a Jew. So it's just like I didn't. So that was an actual Paul. I didn't know that. So that was a policy. It it was. I don't know if it was like officially written down, but yes, it was a clearly understood policy that you know we're we're not trying to mix the races or whatever horrible way they thought of describing it. But it still it still happened. Um, Of course, the the famous scene. One of the most famous scenes is that cabaret style scene where of course she's in the SS officer hat and she's got the suspenders on. Um, And what, you know, this, this Marlena Dietrich style song that she's singing. And what's interesting there is again, it plays like, I, I, I don't think Cavani meant it to be like sexy or anything but it kind of is like it's oh just- <laughs> i think she i think she meant it to be sexy Cavani knew exactly what she was doing oh just, uh, just based on what she said on the criterion channel she's like oh it became a sexy thing but i mean she i mean she I, was like i oh, feel she-. like yeah i, I don't know like- i don't know maybe she was trying to not, I don't know what not her intention to, was, but <laughs> yeah, not to contradict her, but I feel like the way that scene is shot, she knew exactly what she was doing, but then maybe tried to soften it afterwards. Perhaps when people were just like enraged. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Do you, do and you say think, that it was unintentional? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Do do you do you think that was to to illustrate that she was being forced to kind of compromise and now like dance for them. And, but I like, I I wonder, or was it mainly just like, Oh, let's put something in here that something sexy. I don't know what you thought. Yeah. I, I assume it's just a callback to the sort of Weimar decadence that is such a staple in those early movies. Like, the blue angel and and things like that and i think it's another scene that really signifies how this movie is intentionally flirting with that boundary between art house and exploitation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like so she fa- wants to be she wants to be erotic and she wants to be transgressive right. she being cavani right right and, and what's interesting is that the scene suddenly just flips on a switch when that head is delivered uh, and she's, you know, in Dirk Bogart smiling over this, you know, head in a box and, a, you know, Lucia's is this is looks like she's going to throw up as a result of it. And that was another thing about Max that even in later years, when he's talking to the to the woman who who lives at the hotel and he's saying, oh, it's a, our story is a biblical story. And then he tells that story like it's just, like out of Salome, like this 
She told yeah. me that this person was tormenting her in the prisons. And she said, hey, can you transfer him? And I thought, you know, what would be a better idea. I'm going to cut his head I'm off. I'm just going to chop his head right up. Yeah. And it, he's I think... laughing about it. So it's again, <laughs> yes. it's sort of like, like this guy is, is, you know, I know it's interesting that the SS officers say that he's unwell. I mean, obviously they're the ones who are truly unwell. But everyone in this film but he is, is too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just just another illustration of like the psychology of this man that he's still amused by the fact that he cut someone's head off 12 years later. I, you know? I also think it's a comment on how life in those extreme environments can dramatically change people. Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, it's that that, that that's always a, a moment that it's just it's just unforgettable. Uh, yes, not, both visually and just what it reveals about about Max um, in particular. And I think and I think that's why you often saw her even later scared of him or, you know, when he's, you know, like yeah. hitting her and she sort of is helpless towards it because I think she is sort of afraid because she knows what he's capable of. She knows what he's done. Um, which, you know, just makes for uh, another layer to how uh, complicated this, this relationship is. How long, how long did you work on the book? How long did the book take? Off and on, probably like six years. I mean, so I, part of the reason for that is when I started the book, it was just this huge sprawling thing where I wanted, I knew I wanted to write about cult film and World War II. So I had this whole section of it. Originally, the book was going to be in three parts. And one day I would still like to finish and publish the other two parts. So the first part was movies made during the war that could be considered cult movies. So sort of looking at like what genres were people making and you know, were they making any science fiction movies? Were they making fantasy movies? Were they making horror movies? And how did those movies engage with the war itself? Um, the second part was the book that you just read that came out, which was all sort of European art house. And then the third section was cult movies made like horror and exploitation and sci-fi made after the war that are war themed. So not really art house, but like more explicitly like horror movies. And it just became so big and so sprawling that once I reached like a hundred thousand words, I was like, okay, I need to, <laughs> I, I need to like find an actual focus for the book. Right, and right. at the same time that I really got into writing it, my career took off. So it's like, I've been, you know, I wrote a book on Fritz Lang's M and I edited and co-wrote this book on John Rollins films and have been doing all these commentaries. And so I think I, I would like come back to the book and then get distracted. And so within the last year before it came out, I pretty much rewrote the whole thing and included all the stuff that wasn't in there before and I, yeah, I mean, I, if there's going to be a part two, I'd love to read it because it's sort of, it, it leaves me wanting more because, uh, like I said, it's such a page turner and I loved, I loved every minute of it. Um, I'm just curious also, why do you think we don't see these transgressive style of films today? I mean, I know you end the book on Come and See from the mid 80s and you, you offered some, you know, an opinion on that, but I'm curious. What, what, why, why are people not really doing this anymore? I mean, I think it's, there's such a wide variety of reasons. One of which is, I don't think there's really a climate where a lot of filmmakers feel comfortable making these kinds of sexually explicit films. And so I think because of things like cancel culture, which mm. I think is horrible, and necessary things like the Me Too movement. Right, right. I feel like a lot of people are grappling with the question of how do you make transgressive films 
in a way that is thoughtful and sensitive to your performers and right. sensitive to your audience. And I think there are some people who are already doing it, like, you know, Peter Strickland. And to a certain extent, existing filmmakers like Abel Ferrara. Yeah. Like who have been working, you know, forever right. now. And even David Cronenberg is still making those sorts of movies. So I think younger generations, I don't really know why. I mean, I, I think there are people who are trying to explore these themes, but maybe just don't have the sort of personal context that this like whole generation of two, three generations of filmmakers after the war had. Right, yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, like it obviously took a number of years to confront the war in this way in cinema. Yeah. So, because as you said, a combination of cancel culture, which, you know, is terrible, but then the, the necessity of Me Too. So we're, we're, we're learning so much and perhaps people just are afraid to explore it uh, in a transgressive uh, nature. So who knows, maybe 20 years from now, 10 years from now, I mean, we can only hope, I imagine. Yeah, and I do think there are some particularly younger female filmmakers who mm. are exploring more transgressive themes of sexuality again, but I think some of it is it's hard to find an audience. It's hard to find funding. Yeah. And yeah. I think the, the trust that producers had in what we now think of as the art house filmmakers of the sixties and seventies, I mean, even they struggled to get funding Yeah, and generally kind of helped each other out and all knew the same producers, but it's, it's, I think a lot of the issue is, you know, Hollywood is so restrictive like it's akin to censorship the way that like only certain types of stories can be told and if you're a more independent filmmaker it's just so hard to find the funding yeah yeah no I think you're right so hopefully there will be uh there will be a day where we'll still see some you know some some really great films that that speak of you know what's happening right now uh, I, I do a lot of Italian films on my channel. And of course, this, this is Cavani was, is, it, was, is Italian. This is an Italian production. What, what other uh, Italian films in general are some favorites of yours? Everything by Pasolini. Um, I, yeah, he's great. I think if I had to pick one Italian filmmaker, I think he's the genius standing a slight head taller or half a head taller than a number of other geniuses I mean of course there's Fellini is incredible I'm a huge fan of Elio Petri who yeah. made a lot of crime films things like investigation of a citizen above suspicion um, I mean Italy it just you could only watch Italian films from the 60s and 70s for the rest of your life and probably still find more things. So much. <laughs> it's, it's a treasure trove. It's amazing. I'm always, there's actually uh, uh, someone who has a newspaper, a magazine called Italian Cinema Today. And she's always laughing because I'm always going on about these discoveries I'm making. <laughs> Was there any final thoughts you wanted to share on The Night Porter? Just that I love it and hope, I guess, so my frustration recently, or maybe frustration is a strong word. My fear recently is, I think because of things like cancel culture and because of this attempt to make films in a much fairer, safer, more equitable environment, which is all very positive. I think younger film students and cinephiles are maybe approaching things in a different, better way, but I also don't want them to be closed off from things like The Night Porter. Like I, last summer, lectured for this film class 
in, at Northwestern and I tried to lecture on the tenant and it was a fucking disaster <laughs> because they didn't want to hear anything I had to say. They just wanted to know how dare I choose a Polanski film. Oh, and right. My right. mind was blown. I was That's like, it's like, haven't, hasn't this been the, like, everyone knows about this. Like, why can't we just talk about the film? <laughs> right. I still, you know, I still have to see that. I didn't know anything about it. Oh my it. God, it's so good. When you were discussing it, I was like, wow, that sounds real. I don't know, for some reason, the fact that he was the lead in it, I just thought, uh, I don't know, not that I think he's a bad he's actor. He's a great actor. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, it, what, what sort of never got me interested in it, because I like him as a filmmaker. But I know what you mean, because I have, um, you know, I've, uh, well, actually, I think I've only reviewed Rosemary's Baby by him. And I have had people comment, well, I don't, let's, what, let's talk about movies that rapist and direct. So, but it's an also, oh my God, you know, that makes me so angry. Like, it's so much more complicated than that. It and is, it is. It, like, movies aren't just made by one single person. They're made by a whole team of people. And so right. if you want to say, let's only talk about movies not made by rapists, like, what about movies produced by rapists? There goes yeah. all of Miramax's catalog. Oh, that's, <laughs> like, that's a good point. Yeah. That's, which, yeah. So it's like, to just write off works of art like to say you know picasso was abusive and two of his partners killed themselves like goodbye to all of cubism yeah. like it's just not productive and right. i don't think it's like yes those are important conversations to have but this like very black and white mindset of here are the approved topics and here are the non-approved topics mm, like mm. i it just so i hope that younger people can be introduced to some of these movies and consider the complexities yeah yeah no I rather agree. than just being you know able to recognize one facet of it and immediately shutting their brain down how did how did you get around that with the class did, did I didn't manage? it was oh, a disaster oh, wow it was a disaster <laughs> How, how old were they roughly like 20 I imagine 20 to 30 was that 19 the general... 19 20 oh okay so so really young wow yeah I I was not well prepared because I usually when I lecture it's to I think older slightly older people in their 20s 30s 40s who just think about things a different way because they're cult movie fans or, but like these were specifically going to film school and we're teaching a, or we're taking a class about genre cinema and how to make complicated, interesting horror genre films. Right. And so they hadn't seen a lot. Like if I had shown them a John Rollin film, they probably would have been more open and would have thought like, what the hell is this shit? But <laughs> wouldn't have just immediately like you know what I mean <laughs> yeah no I know exactly so it was like whoo yeah. learning experience for me <laughs> wow that's it that's yeah that's really that's interesting that's interesting but I still have to see I still have to see the tenant and I must admit I have never been and I love Pasolini but I've never been able to bring myself to see Salo just because it's it a looks, doozy I feel like it's going to just keep me up <laughs> just like I've seen will. clips and I've been like oh my god I can't see that and it's brutal. It is. And I ran into a friend of mine years ago and he was surprised. He told me it was funny. So maybe I don't know what I was just I was just about to say to you, parts of it are very funny. Pasolini had a wonderful sense of humor. And to a degree, I think it's probably the best adaptation of Saad that mm. is available, but it's very ugly. It's yeah. Uh, such a crowning achievement of filmmaking but like the movie opens with a list of recommended reading that's mostly philosophy so it's like you know you're in for a lot of mental work when mm. you put Salo on <laughs> yes yes I remember you mentioned that in the book I'll have to it's wild I'll, I'll have to push myself to it one day uh I'm sure I'll get to it because as I said I love I love Pasolini Where's uh, where's the best place for people to get the book or to follow you on social media and things like that? 
so you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at, at Sam Deegan. Um, the book is, I mean, on any online bookstore, you should be able to find it. Um, and other than that, I would say the best places to find me. So I have a Patreon where I do provide some like free non-subscriber updates about what I'm doing just because I don't have a website other than that. And I think the place that I'm most active is Twitch of the Death Nerve, which is, uh, my current podcast which is on Apple and Spotify and, and things like that. And we were on Instagram. Is that mainly exploring horror films or is it cult films in general? Or how, what is the podcast about? Our, our general focus is psychotronic cinema. So the most recent episode that we just published today is on Tinto Brass's Caligula. Uh, we oh. try to sort of alternate between different countries and decades and subgenres, so we do have horror movie episodes but a lot more than that too okay great awesome well i will leave the link in the description box below where people can follow sam and and get her books and check out her podcasts uh and like i said the the book i can't recommend it enough so you could i definitely recommend uh purchasing it well, Sam, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate that you took the time to talk to me today about your book and The Night Porter. So thanks so much. And I hope you can come again sometime and talk about some more either World War II films or anything, because I know you're a big film buff. So please come again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for the kind words about the book. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Everything that I have on YouTube and on the audio version of my podcast, of course, is free. But with a monthly subscription on Patreon, that will give me more flexibility to do even more episodes. So if you like my work, and you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, head over to the link for full details. And if you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my podcast, and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I've ever created can be found, youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new videos or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.